Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you guys. And I understand that most of you are in the publishing industry and scholarly communications, so this is going to be a small break uh, from what you conventionally do, but I think I'm going to try to emphasize in the course of this presentation that a, a restructuring of both purpose and method within the industries that you represent uh, could be very valuable uh, to society at large as well as your own uh, trajectory. So I'm going to be taking a, a riff from, from Jana's presentation and start off by talking about a Dutch spy. <clears throat> so the first half of my presentation will be largely historical and to some extent metaphorical so that we can place uh, the lessons that I hope to bring to the table uh, into context and so that afterwards, in fact, when my presentation is over, if you want to actually play with some of the, uh, the real-time toys and the linkages we've built in our facility, you can. I will not spend a lot of time doing that. There will be no PowerPoints, just a live presentation in a while. You can not try to read that because I won't speak to it for a while, but I didn't want a blank uh, screen. So the Dutch spy. Between about 14 something or other and 1595, almost precisely, uh, maritime commerce was dominated uh, by the Portuguese and the Spanish to an extent, but the Portuguese. It was dominated largely because they and they alone understood map making and cartography. They invested heavily in cartography, sent uh, explorers and surveyors out to begin to make proprietary maps of the natural world. <clears throat> well, until that time, in fact, since humans started forming tribal societies and, and proto-economies, the, the single tool that created advantage for societies and tribes was trade. And it was on the backbone of trade that civilizations were born. If you start thinking about trade, you realize that it's really just moving something from one place to another across the natural landscape of the world where the value proposition is a bit different. If you bring a metal somewhere where metal is valuable, you can start an economy. If you bring food from some place where it is abundant to some place where it is scarce, like home, uh, you start an economy. And so consequently, the most prominent economies and the most prominent development occurred in those circumstances in which trade was maximized. So what was it that presented the greatest risk to trade? Well, it was, of course, the natural world across which you had to move these goods and services. The natural world imposes enormous or imposed enormous constraints on movement. And so the single biggest tool for economic advancement for thousands, tens of thousands of years was the knowledge of the physical environment. And in fact, the tool for manifesting that was the map. So the ability to, to basically decrease the risk of a journey was the ability which held closely gave advantage. Coming back to the Dutch spy, well, the Portuguese from the 1400s onward started sending their rather cumbersome sailing vessels out and ultimately bringing back knowledge about the natural world, the, generally the seafaring part of the natural world, the coastlines, the reefs, the shores, the routes, and keeping these as state secrets would send out more surveyors and more explorers and ultimately used that um, to form the basis of very substantial commercial empires. <clears throat> now this was basically a monopoly and all of the normal excesses of a monopoly came to play and that included of course rapacious terms and conditions, uh, SLAs basically that nobody in their right mind would sign on to, um, and a very very unfortunate lack of incentive to get any better. So between those early 1400s and 1595 shipbuilding technology didn't really flourish marvelously uh, financial instruments didn't develop, insurance, uh, business instruments didn't develop, navigation tools didn't develop much, and it was the natural consequence of a monopoly. So what happened in 1595? Why do I talk all about maps and the Dutch and whatnot? Well, there was a Dutch merchant uh, and explorer and generally pragmatic, well that's repetitious, but a, a pragmatic Dutchman who was working uh, as an employee of the governor of Goa in India, who of course was Portuguese, because basically the world of long distance maritime commerce was Portuguese. So he was working there and stumbled across, <clears throat> this is a very cinematic story, I would love to see someone uh, brave enough to make a great movie of it, and stumbled across the entire lore of Portuguese cartography in the back rooms of the governor's estates, and did the very pragmatic thing. He, he stole it, <laughs> and, he, and he stole it and he took it back 
to Amsterdam through a very circuitous route, but he took it back to Amsterdam and then did the completely unpragmatic Dutch thing. So instead of selling it to a Dutch merchant house, I mean, this was the, the maps, the charts, the soundings, the navigation directions, everything that gave the Portuguese the complete domination of the high seas and trade. And he didn't sell it to the Dutch merchant houses of the day. He did the foolish, foolish thing of, in one decision, changing society forever. And I think it may be the grandest thing that's ever been done, ever, in society. He published that open access. Okay, and it was open access. No copyright, no lawyers. Um, it was post-Gutenberg, and it was called the Itinerario. And within five years, it had been translated, and within the next five years, we saw the birth of the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company, shattering forever the monopoly over long-distance commerce. So what ended up happening, because this guy, Jan Huygens van Linskoten, had the temerity to share the information, not just with one entity, but with multiple entities, they were able to collectively assume the de-risking of the natural world. So from a highly risky activity, it became very, very rapid, rapidly a less risky, sensible activity. And we saw the birth of remarkable competition in seafaring technology, but also in the development of legal instruments and of financial instruments, such as insurance or joint stockholding companies. A massive explosion in the development of societies because we lost the monopoly of de-risking. So what on earth, you would say, has this to do with both scientific publication and our purpose here today? <sighs> Almost always the justification for science is that we're taking a knowledge journey of value to society. But if it's really a knowledge journey we're taking, are we taking it so that we can go back to our cold, dank caves and scrabble around for food? Or is it a knowledge journey that we take not just to cogitate upon, but to craft advantage for our societies, our tribes, our planet? indeed for our circumstances. Ultimately, all of us <clears throat> under duress would have to say that we live under the premise that scholarly research and scientific research feeds progress of some sort, ill-defined perhaps, but progress not just in our knowledge of the world, but our manifestation of that knowledge in something tangible economically or socially. In other words, we don't really think that scholarship in a closet is sufficient justification. Even if the closet gets bigger and bigger and bigger with more scholars, it's not enough justification for scholarship to say, well, we know more. The idea is that knowledge should actually inform changes in our society, changes in our policies, changes in what we do. The most prominent part of that dates back to the origins of this uh, royal society, the ability to turn knowledge into substantial uh, substantial economic change and substantial social change through the Industrial Revolution and once it became uh, more understanding, understandable what the externalities were, social revolutions of some substance. So where does this all link into the Dutch uh, spy? What I'm describing through commerce and the history of commerce and mar maritime travel is basically innovation. Now, economists will use this very different than scholars. Scholars, especially scientists, like to think of themselves as innovative. But an economist will tell you that an innovation is only when a novel product or process interfaces with the market, where actually there's a substantive uh, challenge to an idea to make a thing, a thing that can be tested in the economy. So I'm going to use for the rest of this talk the term innovation, not to mean a new idea or, gosh whiz, this is a swell new result, but actually something that manifests itself in a change in our lives through an econ economic impact. So an innovation is a new idea made real in, in society in somehow, some manner. Okay, so long-distance maritime commerce was, in a sense, taming the process of innovation, but the true innovation was not creating a new thing, it was accessing a new thing through this process of moving it about. So what happens if we fast forward the Van Huygens Linschoten, uh, yeah, yes, Jan Huygens Van Linschoten, I guess you learned a cargo better, um, paradigm into the future. Well, the major risk right now in economic and social development is not through moving materials through seascapes and landscapes. Uh, we would be crazy to think that the physical disposition of our world is a bottleneck to progress right now. It's not. I mean, we all live in the, in the land of, of readily available maps, which are considered generally public goods. 
That's not what gives economic primacy or advantage anymore. It's now moving, moving ideas through ideas space, converting ideas uh, from one type of idea to another. We're not converting physical materials from one place to another. We're converting materials, ideas, through knowledge space. And that knowledge space presents in its own ways the same degrees of risk and encumbrances as physical space presented in the days of Van Linschoten. So how do we navigate that? Because if we want to turn scholarship into something of economic and social value, we can't do it by just writing about it and thinking about it and returning to our cave and talking about it. We have to allow it to turn into value. And that's through this process that I would call science-enabled innovation. Well, there is a body of knowledge that was started by another remarkable person. Uh, at least the part of it that I really like was started because he's a family member. Uh, and that was about um, 225 years ago. Uh, strangely enough, in the United States Constitution, it was actually written that there should be a mechanism that advanced science and the useful arts. Uh, and it was one of the few times that such a mechanism was enshrined into a constitutional document. And this was the patent system that Jeffrey is so fond of. Uh, and I must admit, I'm not fond of it either. Uh, but it was actually the original open access publishing tool. When people talk about open access, there's a precedent going back over 200 years because the purpose of the patent system was enshrined in its very name. Patente in Latin was to lay open. The patent is not a tool for denying knowledge. It's a tool for sharing knowledge, or it was. And the reason, there were no learned journals at the day. So how could Thomas Jefferson, in trying to establish the United States patent system, tease this primitive culture uh, that existed on the other side of the Atlantic into a modern a modern economy, a modern society. Well, the only way is to build upon, sequentially, the knowledge of one to another. And that had no means to be shared. Uh, so there was no means to share that knowledge, and so Jefferson established the U.S. patent system. The purpose of the U.S. patent system was to say, if you would only tell us the secrets, the things that you have learned, we can allow others to build upon them. And the incentive to share was there. And the incentive was, we'll give you a limited monopoly for a short time to be the only one who can practice that invention. So if someone had developed a spring, a new chronometer, something of that sort, they had to publish that in sufficient detail that anyone who read the Patent Gazette of the day could actually learn from it, build an improvement, and so on and so forth. But that disclosure acquired a government-given right to exclude others from doing the same thing for a short period of time to secure some degree of, of reward for having taught the world what uh, he or she knew. This is where it starts to get really interesting in the history of the patent system. <clears throat> because the law is very, very good at describing, actually I should just turn it off for a while, is describing what you can't do. But it's terrible at ever telling you what you can. Because law in general doesn't know what's out there. It only knows the grants that it gives or the rights that it confers. So when Eli Whitney, who was one of the first beneficiaries of the, of the patent system in the late 1790s, um, acquired a patent on the cotton gin, which was a tool for mechanically separating the seeds from the fiber of cotton, which ultimately revolutionized the industrialization of fiber. Um, he actually had to provide a working example of that to Thomas Jefferson and convince him that it was new, not obvious, and useful. Now, the bar is very high when your patent examiner is Thomas Jefferson, who himself was a fine inventor. Um, at any rate, he would do that, and in exchange, he received a patent that gave him the right to stop others from making the patent, uh, the cotton gin. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Because what the implication was, the inference that he made was that he could manufacture that cotton gin. Now, the patent doesn't say you can manufacture it. It says you can stop others from manufacturing. But in 1790s, an invention was an innovation. It was a product. So the cotton gin was a product unto itself, and a patent that stopped others from making the product would probably let you make the product, because it's self-contained. So the early patent was a tool to exclude others from doing something with a nod and a wink that you could do it. Well, over the next 200 years, science exploded with our knowledge of the natural world, and the size of the invention, the least inventable unit, to, to paraphrase, became smaller and smaller. And the number of these units necessary to make a real product became larger and larger. 
So visual metaphor number two, the jigsaw puzzle. Um, in Eli Whitney's day of making the cotton gin, the puzzle was a single piece puzzle. Okay, he knew what it was going to look like and how it was going to work. It's pretty easy to make a one piece jigsaw puzzle. It's there. It's done. Boom. Now, let us imagine, however, that in, in this thought experiment, that Eli Whitney used a little camshaft that actually, unknown to him, somebody in Bedford, Massachusetts, had patented. Well, strictly speaking, then, if he starts manufacturing the cotton gin without the permission, or even knowledge for that matter, of this other camshaft patent owner, he would be infringing that patent. Now, that camshaft owner, of course, Making camshafts is not necessarily a product that's useful unless the camshaft itself is used. So we're already seeing in just this two-piece jigsaw puzzle the potential anti-commons effect that can happen. If you don't know it's there, you're in real strife. If you know it's there and don't have permission, you're in even more strife. So the patent system was conceived with the idea that an invention was a product. And then it started to creak. For the next 200 years, it got more and more troublesome because now, if you look at a pharmaceutical, an iPhone, a crop, a microphone, almost anything, the number of pieces of scholarly knowledge, of patented technology, of sometimes regulatory or standards approval, that are required to assemble an economically useful product is huge. It's often said that there are more than 10,000 pieces of patented knowledge embodied in an iPhone, and I suspect it's much more than that. So if this is the case, what is the value to one piece holder, one person, one institution that has created one part of that puzzle? Well, if we pull the lens back economically to us, it should be actually a zero value to them because we want the whole thing. And if we start celebrating the value of each piece, the assembled puzzle will be very expensive indeed or maybe not even put together. So we have a standard problem to solve, a standardizing problem. If we have jigsaw puzzles with many, many pieces, how can we ever assemble them cost-effectively if we celebrate the value of each piece? So this is where the four rules of the jigsaw puzzle come in and how it applies to scholarly enabled or scientific enabled innovation and how we can actually merge the enormously valuable work of Crossref with the real world. So the four rules of the jigsaw puzzle, I mean most of you looking around uh, will probably either have children or have been children, in which case, if you have, you have assembled a jigsaw puzzle, and you know the first rule, don't lose the box. If you lose the box, the jigsaw puzzle comes in, you don't know what you're assembling. Just imagine if someone walks up to you with a plastic bag full of pieces and says, assemble this jigsaw puzzle. And if you cannot visualize what you're going to assemble, you're, you're in a terrible, terrible circumstance, right? You need to know that it's the Sydney Opera House or it's the Eiffel Tower or it's Big Ben or whatever you're assembling. If you can't see it and if the pieces are, are not turned over, you can't begin to assemble it. So that's the first rule of the jigsaw puzzle, don't lose the box. You have to visualize the innovation you wish to create. Second rule of the jigsaw puzzle is sort of, I guess you'd say, um, shepherd the pieces. If you've lost 10% of the pieces down a heater vent or the dog or something like that, you can still probably put it together. But a little bit more than that, and it's hopeless. You know that there are going to be critical joining pieces that you don't have, you don't even bother trying. So, you know, keep the pieces. Make sure there's enough pieces. That's rule number two. Third rule, start from your advantage. Everybody does this. You start the corners and the edges. And if somebody, the last time they did it, put a big blob of pieces together that stayed together in the box, you, ah, we all do it. You put it down and you build from it. So you always nucleate. So rule three, start from your advantage. You start from something you know and build from there. And the fourth rule, which really screws us badly, is the Douglas Adams rule, which is don't despair. It's not as hard as it looks. It's standardized. They're meant to fit together. Now, this is where science-enabled innovation has some real, real strife and where in the area of copyright, initiatives like Creative Commons have been so hugely valuable. The ability to standardize the way things fit together is hugely important in jigsaws. It's enormously important in making real products and services out of the acts of scholarship that you all publish. And it's something we fail at miserably. But it turns out, luckily, we fail at all the other ones too, so we can just start uh, hacking away at all of those. So consider somebody trying to make a vaccine against Ebola or malaria or virtually anything to which um, the beneficiaries are either extraordinarily diffuse, such as 
products for climate change, or extremely poor, such as those who would benefit from a malaria vaccine. Well, in that situation, we have another problem. Because it takes so many pieces to assemble a product that works, we have this problem of the peacemakers. Blessed be the peacemakers, those who are making the pieces of the puzzle. Every single academic institution, and many others as well, celebrates the maximum value, financial value, you can obtain for a patent license or patent fee. Now, considering the simple metaphor of the jigsaw puzzle, which is actually a pretty good one, I think, imagine how, what effect that has on the price of the, of the puzzle, assembled puzzle. If the assembled puzzle is a vaccine for malaria, and if each of the components is celebrated, and each of the inventors celebrated for how much they can get for a piece, it will be an untenably expensive puzzle to assemble. And that's the market failure. That's what we have as market failures. Why we have public science, public scholarship, public funding at all is because things don't always work to assemble the pieces with a big giant call for money. There's a huge need for public funding, but only if we can legitimately argue that that public funding yields public good. Now, all of us live in this echo chamber of scholars citing scholars, but somebody has to make a public good that's tangible from all of that work. That's where understanding the relationship between scholarship and making things matters so very much. It matters to you because you must justify the scholarly publishing activity. It matters to the public, of which you're a member in principle, because they must justify why they're giving us, or scholars, or researchers, their money. There's a moral imperative to this as well. We have an innovation system that is almost incomprehensibly complicated, but it's also in staggeringly inefficient because we have lost the box tops. We can't see the pieces we need to assemble. We don't all share the same competitive advantages and starting points. Many of the pieces are not there, which is actually not so bad because that's what research could be about by filling in the pieces that are missing. And they're not standardized, but we can do something about that. So, let's come to more or less modern days. Um, about 25 years ago, when I was very active as a molecular biologist, I was an inventor uh, of technologies that were useful in genetics. Or I thought they'd be useful in genetics. That was why I was inventing them. Uh, and back then, before I got a thin skin and aversion to scholarly publishing, uh, I actually published some of it. But more importantly, I distributed these technologies very widely, thinking that that was going to stimulate many diverse players improving crops with these technologies, because they were in plant sciences. Um, and what ended up happening was that my little piece of the jigsaw puzzle that I sent out to everybody, long before publication, actually, so fine heart, wonderful, laudable activity, a good invention, really worked well, sent it to everybody. Uh, and it was the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle that was needed for Monsanto to genetically engineer soybean and cover the world with about 100 million hectares of transgenic soybean. That was not my intention. I really wanted to see hundreds or thousands of companies around the world developing interesting, competitive, uh, diversity-enriched local innovations. Ha! I didn't achieve it. And one of the reasons I didn't achieve it is my staggering naivete, which it turned out was shared with virtually everyone I've ever met in the public sector, about what the puzzle really looks like. I had no idea that the disposition of my piece of the puzzle would cause a massive monopolistic consolidation of capability. That what I wanted to achieve was everybody should go on and do wonderful things with my invention had no such outcome. It was, in fact, the converse, because I was ignorant of the shape of the puzzle and the way my piece would have fit into it to build a new nucleation site. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, well, I'm, I must be alone in that, in my, my, my futility. So I joined the United Nations and started working with the Rockefeller Foundation, who was funding extravagantly well in rice biotechnology, you know. And then discovered, when I was troubleshooting their programs for some years, that it wasn't just me, it was absolutely everybody. Every institution in the public sector every institution taking philanthropic money, was comprehensively and, I would say, disgracefully ignorant of the shape of the innovation puzzles. But to have any clue who or which institutions could take this scholarly work forward and actually deliver it to society, and what the consequences 
of the mode of disposition of that work product. Do you make it available in a broad, non-exclusive license? Do you exclusively license it? Who do you talk to? Who do you form relationships with? Who do you consult for? None of this information was a matter of public record as knowledge. So this is where I'm going to come back to maps. The map is really a contextual decision support tool. It's not just a collection of survey points. If I were to tell you, though, to go out and give me, just with nothing but a handheld GPS and a short amount of time and some pencil and paper, a map of London, you'd say it was impossible. And you'd be right. I mean, no single person would be expected to be able to do that in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but if I were to say, well, OK, well, how about just, just Carlton House Terrace? Can you do that? Well, of course, the answer is, yeah, probably I can. I could probably map it out, get it reasonably accurate. But if I were to go to every single neighborhood, every single borough in London, and ask somebody who'd lived there a long time, if they could, with a little bit of a tool, produce a map of that area, the answer is, of course, they could. And if we could combine these maps, what you would end up having is, of course, a map of London. So if I were to say, what is the map of the world of innovation? What are the patents, the standards, the, um, the capital problems, the regulatory compliance issues for all the things we have to do in, in electrical engineering, in, in vaccine production, in water management? It's overwhelming. But if we were to say to you, OK, you're an expert in solid state diagnostics. OK, what if I asked you to make a slightly reusable little maplet of your particular region just tell us something about who are the players, which companies, what countries do they work in, what are their real constraints. And we ask you to just do a little of that. Could you do it? And the answer is almost certainly, especially if there's an incentive. You could do it. It's not so onerous to do a little bit. And if we were to standardize that so someone else doing something just a little bit by that would do their bit, and you'd add it together, you'd add it together, and pretty soon you'd have a map of the innovation space. So the meme that it drives me and drives our institution for the last two decades is innovation cartography. In a sense, what Jan Huygen van Linskoten made possible by opening up grand long distance travel uh, across the face of the earth is possible in the world of innovation as well. Because each of you who are publishers or associate with publishers, in a sense, you are stewards of features of a map. You hold no maps yourself any more than, than uh, uh, Da Gama or Magellan had the entire map. As they were sailing, they were making soundings. They were actually making observations, but they didn't have a map until they all got home, pooled their data, and created a map that could guide the next sailor in a much more efficient and less risky way. We're stewards of features. But what we as a society need are maps. When we have maps, we can make better real-time judgments about the proper course to take at lower risk to see an outcome that we respect. This is the giant current conundrum of scholarly publishing and of publicly funded science. We are operating with no maps. We are assuming that we do science because it's cool or it's neat or someone said it's great science, we throw it against the wall, and someone, somewhere, will pick it up and turn it into social and economic value. Well, that supposition is generally wrong. The vast majority of published science, or of even unpublished science, doesn't get out to society in terms of economic or social value. And that which does, does so at great expense. And at great expense guarantees that the market failure persists. We still don't deal with any of the, the, the diffuse or small market signals that we need to as a moral species and as a, as a melting planet. So how do we deal with this? Well, thank God Crossref comes to the rescue. <laughs> I, I had to do that since they invited me here. So, um, Thanks, Ed. OK. So about 15 years ago, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation came to a similar conclusion to that that my small social enterprise, Cambia, came to, which was that the patent system was at once the largest problem and potential contributor to a solution that there was. Unlike the wrestling that's happening in scholarly publishing, generally the patent system has not had a problem with copyright. Patente still holds true formally that in most jurisdictions, the patent system is fully open. Now, anyone who's had the, the misfortune of having to read one recognizes that's like saying, root canal, free for everybody. Um, it is an awful literature to read, but it is there, and it does teach. Well, it teaches in a highly structured, formal way how to do something if you're a patent lawyer. But luckily, 
we have tools to, tur to turn that into something sensible. So how big is this patent corpus? When we talk about what PubMed Central hosts as open access literature, we're pretty thrilled that it's over 3 million uh, scholarly uh, writings. That's really good, and it, and it really is, even though, according to almost all records, two-thirds of them are probably wrong, uh, there's still, it's a lot of scholarship in there, okay? Well, we host, and we don't have it all, probably 50 million open access articles. And these are articles that can be 50, 100 pages of deep, 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 deep knowledge. If I were to search in PubMed, uh, or the new meta, metadata services of Crossref, um, for any particular field of scientific activity by, let's say, Monsanto, my friend, um, we would find they're reasonably prominent in the scholarly literature. There might be several hundred, maybe even a thousand articles. If you look in the patent literature, there's 10 to 50 times more. And this is true for virtually every single engineering organization, every single life science organization there is. If you really want to know how to make stuff, you don't ask the scholarly literature how to make stuff, you ask the patent literature. And then you, of course, pass it through the filters of patent lawyers, which is really quite expensive and difficult for a while. So, Here's the conundrum. We have the largest open access corpus of knowledge in the history of our species. It's just sitting there, and it's being gatekept by a clergy. Okay, the clergy don't wear fancy you know, outfits and robes. They wear wingtips and suits, but either way, it's a clergy. The language is ecclesiastical. The costs are high. Uh, the, uh, the tithes are unbearable to, to, to get them on your side. So what we have is an opportunity. So you can look at it several ways. As a social entrepreneur, I look at problems like this as, wow, is that going to be fun to break? Um, we have, in the United States Patent and Trademark Office alone, 12 million deep, knowledgeable uh, patent disclosures with no copyright whatsoever uh, that teach almost every inventive activity that's ever gone on in the United States, which is a lot. The British, the Germans, many of the others, and now the Chinese, offer enormous corpora of knowledge. Now, is there a bridge between this, which you might think of as proprietary, though ironically it's not, uh, we'll get to that, and the world in which you live, which ought to be public, but ironically is not, um, that we can make use of? Can we use this bridge to form the beginning of visible jigsaw puzzles, the beginning of innovation cartography? Well, of course, yes, or I wouldn't be talking here. So when one uh, applies for a patent, it has to meet... This is, in, this is in theory. For those of you who know the patent system, know that it really is not in a wink. Um, it has to meet three substantive criteria. The patent has to be new, so you cannot put a patent in on a process that's already been described in, in principle. It has to be non-obvious. That means, uh, depending whether you're the Clapham Omnibus standard or some other standard, a person having reasonable skills in the art uh, should say, whoa, that's special, or that took... Yeah, that took some special thinking to do that. So this non-obviousness criterion is very important, but also quite subjective. And the other, it has to be useful. I mean, it's, it's, it's not enough to just propose something for patent which has no potential utility. So if it meets these three criteria, and if the patent office does its job, which again is a challenging issue, um, then you can be issued with a patent which says that you have the right to exclude others from, for a limited time in a particular jurisdiction. Now, this jurisdictional thing is really super important for those of you who live and breathe in copyright and the Berne Convention, where basically the moment, if you're taking notes in this, first of all, <laughs> I pity you, but if you are taking notes on this talk, the moment you, you write those down, you have a de facto copyright in hundreds of locations, maybe 150, I don't know how many in the Berne Convention, but it's a very large number of places. You don't have to apply for it, and if somebody else writes virtually identical notes, they get one too. Uh, it's a really, actually not a bad situation copyright. Patents are really different. It's really frustrating they call them intellectual property in the same lump. They're not at all. You have to apply for it. Every jurisdiction has to examine it and determine if it deserves a grant and grants you one. And it's only operable in that jurisdiction. So if you come up with a great invention and apply for a British patent, uh, that's the only place you can stop anyone about it. If you don't apply for one in China or the United States, you have no exclusionary rights there. Okay. But when you do this, you're expected to tell the patent office whether it really is new or not obvious. And if you don't, they examine it and say, is it new or not obvious? So what's the first literature they go to? Well, of course, the patent literature, because they're used to it. But the other principal literature is the one that you guys work with in. They cite what is called prior art. So patents must, in general, tell the patent office and 
parenthetically the public, what scholarly knowledge informed or inspired their invention? Oh, now that's really exciting. It's not just one scientist quoting another scientist. It's somebody who wants to make money making something, because these patents are expensive to apply for. And they say that your work, Professor Bloggs, has been inspirational or a prior building block to my invention. So could we draw a line between Professor Bloggs and this patent and say, this, this piece of scholarly work has influenced enterprise activity. Now that's not the same as making a whole product, but it's leading us out of the echo chamber into the world of making things. So of course we can, but of course the patent offices don't make it easy. So just as Crossref and you have all wrestled with poorly formatted strings and poorly formatted documents, the patent system provides amongst the most heterogeneous, wretchedly formatted groups of documents you could hope to see. Um, there is zero oversight in the form that a citation is put uh, into a patent record. So if you look at a United States patent and the prior art citations, they are unstructured strings, completely random apparently. Uh, you might use Proc Natal Akkad Sai USA, or you might say PNAS, or you might say almost anything else because nobody oversights it and nobody cares. You might have authors, Jefferson et al. You might just have all of the authors. You might not have any of the authors. You might have the title, you might not. So what we have in the patent record is the potential, if we could extract them, of an enormous number of linkages between scholarly output and economic ambition. Because that's really all the patent, uh, uh, the patent system in its bald form represents is ambition. But that's not a bad thing because you can see if people are putting their money there and lots and lots of money, what that might mean. So let me show you what we're about to release. We have not actually made a formal um, launch of this, but working together over the last couple of years with Crossref, with Carl Ward and Jeff uh, and our software engineers, what we've been doing is taking the work product that we had developed over the last 10 years, which had been called Patent Lens, uh, which was the most popular free and open patent search site in the world, and melded it with a scholarly world of of publishing. First, about the patent lens, what it was and what it, <coughs> uh, why it's turned into the lens. When Rockefeller uh, funded us in the early days to try to make the patent system more transparent so that their funded laboratories could understand what was happening uh, in the world around them in biotechnology, there was no free patent search site in the world. Most patents were not available in a full text Form. So we set out, in, with the, the hubris of ignorance, to buy the world's patents and, and liberate them. Uh, we were <laughs> abolitionists of a sort. So we actually would spend up to $100,000 uh, to buy the United States patent listings, which were on, we even had to buy an old IBM, what is it, 3270, those old tape, remember the old tape? We didn't have one. And they had stopped making them, IBM had stopped making them, so we actually had to scrub up an old out-of-stock Fujitsu tape reader so that we could simply asset strip the United States holdings. Uh, legally, of course, because they're not copyrighted. Um, so we did that, and we had to do all the OCRing of the World Intellectual Property Organization, the Australian stuff, and started putting it together in a text searchable system. Now, this was pre-Lucene, so we had to make our own search tools, and this was when, when memory was expensive and we had to do incredibly clever algorithms, <laughs> I didn't do any of them, uh, to, to witch things into a small amount of memory and it was really good and, and yay it was good uh, for a few years and then Lucene came out and yay it was better and we got better and better at this until about five years ago we had sort of reached a point where simply doing full text patent searching was taking us down a rabbit hole, okay? And when I say that I mean this, say that I mean this, um, we didn't want to do patent search. That's like saying, show me in the world where there's a reef. Show me in the world where there's a um, current. Well, that's not very useful unless you know that that's where you want to be. What we wanted to do is not find a thing. We wanted to put it in context so that we could have real decision support tools. Because if you do a patent search, you get a long list of patents, and it's almost all bad news. Oh, jeez, what do you do with it so you don't do anything with it? If, however, you're doing something as a scientist, doing something as an entrepreneur, doing something as a business person or investor, and you have knowledge that can guide your daily decisions on a real-time basis, you can do something with it. 
you will use the thing. So we had to stop being a patent search site and become an innovation cartography site. And at about the same time, the Gates Foundation decided that they actually believed us. So they started funding us to help because they were in an unusual situation of funding scientists, Berkeley or, or um, the Wellcome Center or whatever else, and industry to get into the same room and try to come up with solutions, vaccines, what have you. And they spoke different languages and they had different imperatives and they didn't know how to make the pieces fit together because the public sector didn't know there were other pieces than their own and the private sector didn't really understand the incentives for these guys. So they wanted a lingua franca. So we started working on this thing, migrating patent lens into lens where we could build links between scholarly, uh, regulatory, legal, business, and patent knowledge into shareable, embeddable, and annotatable resources. Because the power of the Van Linschoten heresy was really not just that he published it, but it then stimulated aggregative knowledge of the natural world. If you can't add your knowledge to someone else's and someone else's on top of that, you never will get anywhere. So open, annotatable, and embeddable meant that we had to break the paradigm of an information gatekeeper. Everyone else in the world to that point, and actually even now, still charges for access to patents. So if you want to build a landscape that builds on someone else, it'll only work if they're also a subscriber to that service, which is a dead business model. If anybody thinks for a millisecond that in five years people are going to be charging for access to information, I think you're going to find yourself in for a rude surprise. Um, so we changed our, our, our approach, and here's what we've got. This is called the Lens, and it currently hosts about 90 million documents from 100 jurisdictions around the world. And because of the jurisdictional issue, this matters a lot. And I'll explain how it works, and then I'll explain how the work with Crossref has gone, and I'll show you the URL. Now, this particular interface, uh, my engineers will shoot me for showing it, but it's dev.lens.org. It's the development interface that will go public in about a month. So you can play with it. There's no, nothing like that. The, the, the production one has a, um, it's not as good. So just don't go to lens.org. It'll work, but it's not as pretty. So this is the one you can play with. It'll still work. Now, these are roughly, well, we're going to kick over to 90 million probably this week. Uh, but that represents this number. You won't be able to, see, this is a problem with this little screen. You don't see if I blow it up. Um, this number here is the number of records in an empty search. These are the jurisdictions. And you say, what little itty bitty graphs? Well, in the lens, of course, you can have everything uh, blow upable and facetable. So we faceted just about everything in its dog. So you can use this as an exploration tool. Faceting, for those of you who don't do it, is an enormously powerful tool to find the unexpected, which is a very important part of, of uh, exploration. Um, but it's also interesting because it's fully embeddable. So every single analysis you ever do, every collection you make, uh, you can simply embed it in any HTML delivered page anywhere in the world, and anyone who clicks on it checks your work. So it's one of those situations where any collection, any annotation, any aggregation is shareable in such a way that someone can build upon it. You can clone this uh, collection, uh, you can build upon it, share it with the next, and so on and so forth. In a sense, it's like the WIC IP deal. Um, but here's where it gets interesting. If you're just looking at patents, let's say I'm looking at, um, uh, pick a topic, uh, cancer. Oh, let's do Ebola. That's always topical and lots of fun uh, and easy to spell. So I do Ebola, what we find there's only 14,715 patents that cite Ebola. Well, Ebola was only discovered in 1976, so that's kind of a lot of filings about Ebola or that have Ebola in the text. But you can do much more than that. You can actually drill through on any of these features, look in the different jurisdictions in which they're held, the dates, the inventors, of course. But this is the part I want to draw your attention to. We spent a substantial amount of time over the last couple of years working with Dave Lippman and the PubMed folks and with Jeff, Carl, and Crossref to try to extract that wretched sets of strings of data and match them up with prior art citations that are persistent, uh -huh. DOIs, or PubMed IDs for that matter, uh, and start to build crosstalk between these enormous corpora. And we've now got uh, probably in the range of about 10 million such citations out of the patent literature marked up, and it's just taken off like a shot. So let me, instead of looking at Ebola, which we can do if you want, I thought I'd show you something else. Um, what we have is, we made up this little WordPress site, just last night, actually, uh, one of my interns is doing this for me. And we just decided to pick a few scholars who we either know and like, like Andy Fire, an old pal, Liz Blackburn, an Australian, yes, um, Cesar Milstein, local boy makes good, uh, if, if you're Argentinian, um, and David Lippin, my hero and friend. Uh, so I just, I'm going to show you David Lippin. This is an example of what you can do with this system. 
Now, David, besides being the founding director of PubMed, is also arguably amongst the most cited scientists in the history of science. Uh, he wrote uh, and co-wrote the algorithms for comparing one DNA strand or one protein strand to another called BLAST. Um, and in that category, as a scholar, he is amongst the most remarkable scholars that has ever existed. He's enabled more research in the scholarly literature than almost anyone you could think of. What's incredibly interesting is we could now trivially find out uh, how many patents have cited David Lippmann. And we find here that there's 5,000 patents representing almost 4,000 separate inventions around the world that cite David Lippmann. We can also look at what those articles are, thanks to work that Carl and, and our team have done together with Jeff. We can actually compare that to the, to the mining of PubMed itself, look at the numbers. They're going to be different until we reconcile everything. And this allows, for the first time ever, a complete misuse of our work product to make a metric. And this is going to happen, and I'm sure it'll happen soon, and it'll be really regrettable. What's going to end up happening is that the horrible world of metrics will now realize, hey, we can justify to our paymasters how economic impact flows from our publications. And yes, kind of indirectly you can, and it's still not very useful, but people will do it. There will be an enterprise influence metric that actually takes some sort of Jiggery pokery and normalizes it to this on Tuesdays with blue, this and that, and then you'll get a number like an H index. It'll be a, a lens index or something that says how impactful on enterprise has been a piece of scholarly work. I can look at my own work in here and say, look at this, 280 patents uh, are in there. Here's what makes it different, and I'll get it done in a second, Jeff. Here's what makes it different. I can do the following thing, which is really quite special. I can look at what industries are filing patents that cite my work, or in this case, David Lippmann's work. I can look at these. This is, this is it's an unlimited list, it seems like, of companies. So let's look at number one. Gen and Core International is citing 73, in 73 patents. So I apply that, and I say, what can I do with that? I can now look at the patents from any company that's citing my work, and what does that offer me as an opportunity? Oh my gosh. What if I'm funding constrained and these guys cite my work and I can talk to them because they're trying to make money based on the science that I have done in some way? Why don't I talk to them about a contract? Why don't I talk to them about consulting fees? Why don't I talk to them about funding my research? There's an idea. And there were hundreds in that list alone, which means almost all of the authors in your stable of journals using this sort of metric, uh, and, but more importantly, this sort of tool, can now in real time explore who's using their scholarship with the ambition to make money. Making money is not an evil thing. Many of you would agree. Uh, it is interesting, though, because the difference is we either have a score, which is eh, meh, or you can have a tool where the scholars who, who publish in your journals can use in real time to find new partnerships, new linkages, new opportunities, new subject matter. We can use this in an almost unlimited way to expand the scope of influence of scholarly work on economic and social reality. So yes, we'll develop a metric from it. But I think so much more is possible through this concept of innovation cartography. So the last point I'll make in literally one minute is the following. I can now take this, and with a single click, I take all results, and I can make a collection out of it. So let's actually, in fact, just to save some time, I'll show you some of the collections I already did. You can make a collection instantaneously. This is all free, by the way. Look at the collections, and I've got stuff like this Monsanto collection, Dave Lippens. Hey, there's my patent citations. And with a simple way, I can now share that. <laughs> Sharing, it's so fashionable. That URL right there, I can give to any and all of you. I can, I can embed it. You can then take my full collection and with a single click, copy it yourself, clone it, add something else to it, copy it, clone it, comment. And every single one of these documents now is annotatable, shareable, blah, 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 blah. So what I'm going to leave you with is the prototype for innovation cartography, because this is, an, an, is a never-ending prototype. Just like map making didn't end when he published the itinerario in Amsterdam, it began then. So this is, in a sense, the beginning of the innovation cartography exercise over the next five to 10 years. And I think that uh, Carl and Jeff and Ed have been seminal in making the bridge between these scholarly publications, which we all know and love, and economic progress, which, of which we are all beneficiaries. I'm incredibly excited about what we can do with this concept of innovation cartography, both to, to justify and substantially to refine uh, public scholarship and research. Uh, remembering that our job as 
as publishers or, or funders of scholarly research, or those of us who even still do it, is not just to do more of it, but to do better stuff. Not just better by virtue of whether we get more citations, but better whether it makes society better. And we can no longer do it in the echo chamber. It's time to actually ask, how do we make society better economically and socially? And this is one step in that direction. It is by no means the only one. But I encourage you to play with it, to give us feedback, to improve it, to work with us as we move it to the next step. Um, but this metaphor of innovation cartography, let it rankle around inside your mind over beers, because I think there's many, many useful directions we can go working together on this. And I applaud Crossref for the courage uh, of sentencing poor Carl to work with our engineers uh, for so long to make this thing happen, and you deserve great credit for that. Thank you. It's over. Done.